The following broadcast was produced by the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Francisco as part of our Lighthouse Learning Library. Have you ever wondered if you were, uh, you want to be that fly on a wall of somebody else's interview? Always love to see how the competition does. Taking that schadenfreude of somebody who does an exceptionally bad job in an interview. There's all kinds of ways in which uh, people have, um, have not lived up to their potential. And um, I'm listening here to a little bit of noise over there. I wonder if we could. Yeah, OK. And we've spent a lot of time learning from people's successes in the last couple of days. But I also think we can learn from people who may have benefited from a different path. So um, Julie McCarthy is not the NPR Pakistan correspondent that you may have heard about. <laughs> she works in, as a chief of human resources for the Lighthouse. It's been my pleasure to work with her since I've come on board. She has a huge background in hiring well before she got to the Lighthouse. And what she doesn't know about hiring ain't worth talking about. So Julie, the floor is yours. Hey, y'all. How you doing? <laughs> now, since I've been billed as the dragon lady, or dragon woman, I just want to say that dragons are not born, they are made. Okay, some of us are born that way, but still. So what I'm gonna do today is just talk to you a little bit about some of the things I've seen over the years. Some, some things have gone awry, as you can imagine, in an interview setting. I'm gonna ask you a question that Mr. Xavier asked first. Uh, when do you think your interview starts? Anybody have an answer other than what they've given earlier? Dean is saying when you first meet a person, and that can be true. Yes, that's the answer that I, I agree with the most because that's when you're gonna catch the mistakes that can screen you out days later. If I'm at work one day and I look at Andrew here and I think to myself, I can't look at his face one more day, I'm <laughs> out of here. That's the day my interview starts because that's the day I'm going to think, well, Yes, I am a masochistic Wiccan Facebook addict, but should that be my email address? <laughs> Maybe not. Or my resume, I worked hard on it, and it's still on the floppy disk in the Microsoft format that came with the program. Remember that <laughs> resume format? <laughs> That's what I'm going to think about, how accessible I am. I know people who take pride, for instance, in not having a cell phone, not being wired. That can backfire on you. That's when I should start thinking about etiquette. When's the last time you had to practice good etiquette in public? That's good. Some people, you know, they've been home for a while or they're busy screaming at their kids or whatever it is and then they don't know how to interact, maybe giving off to that best possible start in, the, in a work environment. You gotta think about that. Your outgoing voicemail message, you know, maybe you taught your dog how to bark out a message in Morse code and your ham club loves that. <laughs> they love that. But the hiring manager doesn't want to spend five minutes listening to that. So just little things like that, your cover letter, your social network, do you really want your Burning Man pictures open to everyone? <laughs> so those things can affect you kind of early on. Some people, their interview starts a little differently. Maybe it'll start with um, a phone call or a chance meeting. I think Mr. Xavier mentioned it could start in a, sh in a store. That's certainly possible. So over the years, I've seen some people make some mistakes without sitting across the table from me. Uh, at one job, uh, it was my first dot-com job, and uh, they'd gotten a resume from someone who had a, a, an extensive engineering background. This was a very popular company to work for. We were very cool. And so I called this guy. The CTO asked me to call him, and I said, you know, Poindexter, can you come in for an interview? And Poindexter says to me, uh, why are you just now calling me? I said, I don't know, I just got here. I've, you know, I'm pretty new myself, but I was asked to give you a call and see if you'd like to come in for an interview. Oh, you should have called me a long time ago. I'm perfect for your company. I can't believe it took you all these weeks. Okay, so 
I'm coming straight out of a, a large insurance company I had worked for, and now I'm in dot-com land, and we're all free and easy and skateboarding down the halls and all that. So as I, <laughs> as I hang up the phone, I say casually to the CTO, we were sitting you know, in, in the same work area, I said, well, that guy, he was kind of rude. He should have just uh, made the appointment with me, which he declined to do at that moment. And the CTO said, well, then he's out. And I recoiled. I said, no, no, I don't want to hurt this guy's chances of getting a job. I'm just telling you he was kind of acerbic. And, you know, <laughs> when I call him next time, uh, we'll make the appointment. And, and the CTO said no. And the head of development said no. If he was rude to you, then he's out. So then I realized, unlike my last job, that I had a little more input into what would go on in the hiring process. So we never called that guy again. And he really was perfect for the job, but he was just a jerk when I called, and that was not the right response. Mm. I remember one woman coming in. Now, my name is Julie McCarthy, so people look for red hair and green eyes. Now, if you can see me, you know I don't have those things. <laughs> I've used that to my advantage at times. And so, same job, I let this woman come in, and I wanted to see how she interacted with people, so I was purposely late. I was standing there watching her. She comes in, she's on her cell phone, she snaps at our receptionist, she's exasperated into the phone, oh, I can't believe this woman's late, you know, my time's valuable, blah, blah, blah. Well, as you can imagine, she didn't turn up as a colleague. Not because she was rude to me, but because she was rude to who, did I mention? Yeah. And if she's gonna treat him that way, how is she gonna treat the rest of her colleagues? She didn't know her interview had already begun because I was standing right there. And so I wanted to know how, whenever I interview, I'm trying to see the real you for just a moment. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I saw the real her in that moment. Um, I'm thinking of a rude guy on the phone. I worked, there was one company where I worked a 22 hour day. I didn't last there very long. Went home, showered, came back to work and, and the woman said, <laughs> my boss said, I know you're working hard, but you need to work harder. That's when I knew <laughs> it was time for me to go, but it, that's another story. So at that job, I called um, one of our candidates, and it was about 8.30 at night. It was the first chance I had to call him. And a woman answered the phone, and I've learned over the years not to have a woman pick up the phone and say, hey, is Arvid there? Because then that can lead to some discomfort. <laughs> so instead I said, you know, uh, is, is Mr. Jones there? And she hesitated for a moment, and then she gave him the phone. He gets on. I said, is this Mr. Jones? Well, I guess that depends on who this is, doesn't it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, well, I, you know, you sent us your resume, and I'm the hiring, uh, I'm the uh, HR nerd. And uh, you, you could hear him shrivel up on the other end of the phone. <laughs> you, could, <laughs> you could hear it. And then he starts stammering about, well, you know, this is the time telemarketers call, and, and that. I, I thought maybe you were telemarketing. Yeah, no, no, I'm the hiring manager, and I'm going to tell the CTO all about this, neener, neener. <laughs> so <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to put, you, you know, when you are in job hunting mode, you have to stay there. You don't know when the hiring manager is going to call you. It might be 8.30 on a Friday. It might be Sunday afternoon. It might be Saturday morning. Maybe I don't have time to call you any other time. Maybe I'm just trying to catch you off guard. Doesn't matter what my motives are. What matters is that you are ready for my call when I make that call. And so a stranger calls you. You, you got to fake it for a few minutes till you find out if I'm a telemarketer, a bill collector, or maybe, maybe an HR person. Now, following the employer's rules, I find that to be very important. And sometimes people will blow them off. Now, you probably have all heard bypass HR, they're a bunch of morons, go straight to the hiring manager. I didn't say you were morons. <laughs> <laughs> I feel much better now. <laughs> and that could be true. If you know somebody in the company and you're trying to get an unadvertised job, it might behoove you to go straight to the person you know. Hey, Joe, are they hiring any widget makers? You know, can you put in a good word for me? Maybe that's not advertised. But if it is advertised in a certain way, you should follow those rules. How many of you have ever had an HMO plan, health plan? Yeah. yeah. You've got a primary care physician, right? Yeah. They are the gatekeeper. You go to your internist, who's your primary care physician. You've got a rash. You want to go to see the dermatologist. You just can't hustle over to the dermatologist's office. You've got to go through that gatekeeper for care. If you don't, you could be on the hook for the entire bill. The insurance companies are using those gatekeepers to keep costs down and services available. So you've got to follow the rules. Now, some of you have heard a story uh, concerning Van Halen. We've all heard of them, whether or not we like their music. <laughs> and there was a story about them uh, having a contract, a writer in their contract saying that they did not want any brown M&Ms in their bowl when they were backstage. <laughs> have you heard that story? 
No, if there was one brown M&M in the bowl, they could cancel the entire show and you still had to pay them. Now, people thought they, they were just being giant jerks. That's what it sounds like on the surface, right? But David Lee Roth had something to say about this. He said, Van Halen was the first band to take huge productions into tertiary, third-level markets. We pull up with nine 18-wheeler trucks full of gear, where the standard was three trucks max. And there were many, many technical errors, whether it was the girders couldn't support the weight or the flooring would sink in, or the doors weren't big enough to move the gear through. The contract writer read like a version of the phone book because there was so much equipment and so many human beings to make it function. So just as a little test, in the technical aspect of the writer, it would say, Article 148, there will be 15 amps, voltage sockets at 20 foot spaces evenly providing 19 amps, this kind of thing. And article number 126 in the middle of nowhere was, there will be no brown M&Ms in the backstage area upon paying a forfeiture of the show with full compensation. So when I would walk backstage, if I saw a brown M&M in that bowl, well, line check the entire production. Guaranteed you're going to arrive at a technical error. They didn't read the contract. Guaranteed you'd run into a problem. Sometimes it would threaten to just destroy the whole show, something like literally life-threatening. So that was, what was the point of the brown M&M? Sure oh. Yeah, make sure that somebody had read the writer and that there wouldn't be any mistakes. And he goes on to talk about places where people did not read the writer and their floor would sink in, that kind of thing, because they didn't know about the technical requirements. And so at Lighthouse, I always ask people to respond to my HR email address, and I do that because I'm a slob and I have several email addresses, but if, if resumes go to all of them, I'll never find yours. So I always point in our ads, please respond to HR, please attach your attachments in Word. So how easy could it be to screen you out there? You attach a PDF when I've already asked you for Word. Why do you think I ask for a Word document? Anybody have any? Yes, in the back? You're close. Kathy's got a mic. Uses less, disk, uses less disk space on the employer's computers. Okay, see, you're way more technical than me. Bingo. Yeah. Dean's got it. So if, if the document was scanned and you're a JAWS reader, maybe you can't access the document very well. So I ask for Word just because it's the most accessible format. So if you send the email directly to my email address, my Jay McCarthy address, or you send it to the hiring manager and not me, or you, you don't attach a Word document, those things can count against you. I'm going to look at every submission that comes in. I, I've been privileged as a hiring manager before, and then as an HR nerd, and now as a senior HR nerd, <laughs> to work in offices or companies of fewer than 100 people. So I've worked for a large insurance company, but our division was fewer than 100. So that gives me, even, in a job market like this, a chance to look at every single submission. And I might only spend two seconds, or I might spend a couple of minutes. I don't wanna spend a couple of minutes on 100 resumes, because that's half a day. And so if you don't remember anything else I say to you today, remember one thing. Hiring is a negative process. Yesterday, Marty Nimco mentioned um, that hiring was like dating. I could not agree more. Because you're gonna screen out everybody that you can to get to the one. And you will use anything you can to screen them out. If we put out an ad for a, an accounting professional, for instance, the Bay Area is saturated with that kind of talent. A technical person, we've got lots of those people here. What am I going to use to screen you out? It, it could be something very small. It could be typos. Uh, it could be that you, not, you didn't follow instructions, that you didn't answer the right way when I called you. It could be anything. So don't fall prey to those easy ways of screening you out. You want to be somebody that I've got to go back to and I can't find any reason not to bring you in for an interview. So how about people who do make it into the room and they are sitting across the table from me. There was an article the other day that Yahoo printed, a couple weeks ago I guess, that was from Business Week. Have you guys ever seen the Yahoo advice columns on how to get a job and how to, and most of them are just garbage. I mean I'm reading them and I'm arguing with the screen. No, that's, that's <laughs> bad advice. That's crazy. Who wrote this? But a couple weeks ago, there was one that was called Self-Defeating Job Search Moves to Avoid. There were 10 of them, and I have seen them all, so let me just tell you what they are. Inflicting Gratuitous Interrogation. 
where I call you and you've got 20 questions for me. Who are you? Why are you calling? Blah, blah, blah. What job is this? Can you read the resume to me? That kind of thing. It drives me nuts. Forgetting who you're interviewing with. Perhaps someone asks you for an example of something and you give them something so far off target that they can't relate it to their operation. Selling yourself short. In this example, a hiring manager was waiting to make a hiring decision and the applicant got nervous, called back and said, you know, if you won't give me that manager job, I'll take the sales job instead. And got the sales job when they were up for the manager job. They, they, they shot themselves in the foot. Uh, letting minor adversity vanquish you. This example is someone who couldn't find the front door unlocked and so they just gave up and went home. Um, they were frustrated, the door was locked, they, they did not call to reschedule or to explain what was going on, just, oh well, can't get in the door. Well, maybe there's a side door, hello. Maybe you should call someone. Uh, sending a generic thank you, that is a job killer. <laughs> Every contact you have with the employer, make it count. And not only are the generic thank yous bad, but when you send the same email to four different people, you think you're being slick. All those people are gonna send them back to HR because they don't want to deal with your, your emails. So I'm gonna see all four duplicate emails and know that you didn't put any thought into it at all. That's only going to hurt you. Uh, frantically self-doubting. This is one uh, where a CEO of a tech startup ran an ad, somebody replied, he said, I'd love to talk to you about this when you have time. She kept questioning him about technical aspects of the job. So he said, there aren't really any technical aspects, but I want you to come in and we'll talk about it. And she kept bringing it up and bringing it up until finally he said, you know what, I'm out. I don't need this. She, she just wouldn't let herself be successful. Go in and talk to the guy. What's the worst that can happen? Maybe it is a little more technical than you thought and, and he's willing to hire you. My first dot com boss said um, he was too old to hire people he didn't like. So he hired people that he liked and then he trained them to do the jobs in his company. And so he was like a people collector. We had people with fascinating backgrounds doing things out of their expertise <laughs> because he brought in people that he liked and then they could learn to do the job. Uh, surrendering to salary worries. This is a story about someone who was 5,000, they were looking for a job that was 5,000 less than what they wanted to make. And instead of going ahead and interviewing for it, they just decided just to walk away from the whole opportunity. Instead of going in and maybe impressing the hiring manager and, and maybe, you know, you can get a bonus or you can have a salary review early, no, I just, I, I refuse to even interview for that, okay? Saying yes to an illogical request. Now, hopefully we don't make these at Lighthouse, but in this, exa in this example, someone um, was asked to write a marketing plan as a, an example of their writing skills and uh, they didn't know anything about the company and went off and wrote a 20-page marketing plan. Well. You know, you did, they didn't know enough to make it valuable to the employer and, and probably overwhelmed the employer, did not hear back. Utterly failing to prepare, this is a big one. In situations where I am the hiring manager and I'm not part of a hiring team, if I ask you what you know about Lighthouse and you say nothing, our interview's over. <laughs> I got nothing to say to you. How dare you come in and not have taken 30 seconds <laughs> to go on the website and say something about Lighthouse. Oh, your building's white, something. <laughs> come on. <laughs> you, hopefully that'll be enough, but you'll be surprised at how many people, they're just playing the numbers, they don't really think that you care. So I'm gonna give you, before I get to some actual stories about interviewing people across the table, I've got some submissions here that I screened out back in the day. I'm not gonna tell you years or anything like that. And usually when I'm reading a resume, a cover letter, I, one word will pop up on my screen that pretty much summarizes it for me. So I'm going to give you some examples, and you tell me what word pops up on your screen. Maybe it's the same that popped up on mine. In this particular instance, we were hiring a project manager, and I saw the email address was whosyodaddy at email.com. <laughs> what, what word comes to your mind? <laughs> the, wor the word I... The word that came to my mind was unprofessional. He was out. Yeah, because why couldn't, I mean, doesn't everyone have a Gmail address now or something? I, didn't I, I mentioned early on, don't have your hobby necessarily as your email address. For work purposes, you know, if your name is Petunia Violet, then that's what it should be. I, it's crazy, some of the things you've seen. And that, that's a mild example. That's one I could actually share in a G-rated setting. Um, here's one. I saw your ad on Craigslist today and acted as quickly as possible. I have heard wonderful things about your company 
and by the way, in the nonprofit world, using company, not cool, and have held you at the top of my list of prospective employers. Oh, that's great. <laughs> I have vast experience in this field and I'm continuing my own education to further serve my community, my resume, blah, blah, blah. Well, Coco here didn't tell me what she was applying for. So I said, for which position are you applying? And she said, I'm applying for the associate teacher or teacher position that is available at the Alameda Housing Complex, and I'm going to City College, I'm getting my transcripts, feel free to contact me. I'm like, we're a lighthouse for the blind. We are not Alameda Housing Complex. You wasted your time and mine. She didn't even write back to apologize. One time I got um, a resume from someone in their um, uh, objective line said that they were dying to get a job at Tyson Chicken. <laughs> and that's fine. And usually, you know, usually I just screen you out. I don't even bother to respond. But in this case, I thought, uh. So I wrote back and told the guy, you might want to change your objective before you send this out again. And he did acknowledge that maybe he should have done that. And he was really embarrassed. I thought that maybe that was advice he could use. Um, here's one. I got an, uh, a submission. Resume, please call. Oh, oh, no, wait. I forgot to ask you. Coco here, who applied to the wrong place, what, what was the word th that you think came up on my screen? The one I just to told you about, where she was applying, a, stu a stupid Kate says. Yeah, clueless was mine. Okay, so here's another one. Yeah, that's much kinder than what I said. Resume, please call. I said, for which position are you applying? She says, I'm applying for any position for which I'm qualified. Smiley face. <laughs> Office management clerical. <laughs> Office management, clerical, project supervisor. Mostly I'm looking for a great group of people to work with and care less about what I do. <laughs> Any word come up on your screen? <laughs> for me, this was frustrating. I mean, office management, clerical, or project supervisor, those are all very different. You can't even bother to, be, to narrow it down. You know, I could be president, or I could be an astronaut, or a fireman. Well, <laughs> that's not helping me. <laughs> well, here's, here's one. Somebody inquired about production positions. I said, we are not currently filling any production positions. Their response was, and this is all one sentence, hello, sorry, I not uns. What means do no open hiring production jobs? Please email to me. Thank you. Wow. What's the word that comes up on your screen? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, what? <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's, that's right, Dean. And I think, I think, yes, absolutely. I think the texting mentality has entered into some not practical applications. And that, that seemed to me to be someone's text response just written out in email. Oh, here's one. Oh, my good friend Efren, yeah. Efren was interested in a position. Uh, please email, email me back if you're interested. Okay, well, um, I specifically said in this ad, please attach your resume in Word. But he just gave me this paragraph and told me to email him if I'm interested. I said, is there a reason you didn't attach your resume here? The reason I didn't attach, sorry? <laughs> no, not on this one, I think lazy's later. Is there a reason you didn't attach your resume here? He says, the reason I didn't attach a resume is that I wanted to get a response email first. <laughs> Here's an attachment with my resume. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then when he did it, it wasn't in Word. Uh, so number two, I said, since we are unable to open your attachment, please resubmit in Word. And he does. And then the next day, my name is Efren, and I submitted my resume yesterday. Were you able to open it? Yeah, by now I've lost interest, Efren, so goodbye. <laughs> What word do you think comes up on my screen? I found him kind of combative. I'm like, dude, back off, you know? You're the one who didn't follow the directions. Don't get mad at me. Here's one. Oh, Gregory, yes. Uh, he says, hi, I'm interested in the position. Write me back if you still need to fill the position. Not please, thank you. And I was like, okay, I said uh, resume, one word answer. He says, I don't have one, however, I can assure you that I am more than capable to carry out any task you can assign me. If you're still interested, let me know, thanks. So what do you think I thought of this one? Clueless is good, I, th I thought arrogant. 
I don't even I don't even need a resume. Yo, girlfriend. Okay, I'm. So, please, you must be kidding. Just, just put me anywhere, and I'm gonna make. Exactly. <laughs> he can be bothered with those details. Here's another one. Somebody, Sally, submitted a resume. Her subject, administrative position. No, no clue as to what she was applying for. So somebody said the word earlier that I was thinking of. They didn't bother to define their position. Lazy, thank you. Completely lazy. Here's Brenda. Brenda and I started talking on a Monday. Hello, I'm very interested in your positions and would like to know the full name of your company, where you are located, your fax number, <laughs> and you when you will be conducting interviews for these positions and how many people you are looking to hire for these positions, when will these positions start, and are they full-time and permanent? Oh my God. <laughs> so I was in a good mood apparently that day because I see here I gave her the name of the uh, company and the address and the fax number. And I said, well, these positions will start filling soon, which is why we're asking for resumes, <laughs> mental giant. So this is on a Monday, right? On a Wednesday, uh, hello, this is Brenda following up. I would like to know the status of my resume uh, and would like to know what decade, only kidding, you will be starting the interviewing process for these positions and when you expect to finalize the process? What is the actual criteria you are seeking in these positions and what is the typical run-through day in these positions? Will these positions be full-time and permanent? Second time she's asked me. I said, Brenda, thank you for submitting your resume. Applicants will be, will be contacted if selected and I told her I was going to terminate this exchange because I don't, not because she was annoying me, which she was, but because I don't want to get into a conversation with one person when I'm supposed to be keeping an equal playing field. So I told Brenda, you know, she gave me the interview on Monday, Wednesday I'm telling her, you need to cool it, Brenda. Well, Friday, I hear from Brenda again. And I'm not gonna read you all seven paragraphs of her response. I'm just gonna read you a couple. We talked on Wednesday, today, oh, I'm sorry, today's Thursday, the very next day. Thank you for finally getting a chance to get back to me. I know that the vast majority of your applicants really don't bother trying to get acquainted with the company that they want to work for, therefore they don't ask a lot of pertinent questions. I have always operated on the two-way entity, part, uh, and no, this, this is the way she wrote it, a uh, partnership to incorporation of the employee supports the company, yada, yada, yada. So we don't even know what she's talking about after a few minutes. <laughs> then we drop down, I believe if you like something and you are skilled in the area you wish to keep, step into or at least have the enthusiasm to learn that is a positive reinforcement that you can bring to the potential company you wish to work for. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> So seven paragraphs later, my, my thought process was, what do you think? Let's hope that's true. You know, I, I got arrogant later. This one, I just went, duh. <laughs> Three contacts, yes. I can hear you. I was, I was just curious as to um, the, if they go through all these different letters <coughs> that you get, um, is there a large percentage of uh, career spelling errors and formatting issues? Uh, there can be. Um, usually people are pretty tight. A lot of people have their resumes reviewed, where I find most of the errors are in cover letters. A lot of people write those themselves. And that's where you see the real person, okay, more so than in the resume. I forgot what time I'm supposed to shut up, Kathy, because I can go on for days at a time. Is it? 
5.15, okay. Let me, let, let me just finish these. There's just a few more. This is from Nguyen, and I'm only going to read you the first sentence or so of their cover letter. I know very clearly and absolutely before to submit my submissional application for the post recruited requirements that my status quo would be completely approved or so ratified based on the recruitmental requirements of criteria as for I graduated from agroforestry realms. <laughs> and I wrote, huh? <laughs> and then because they did not submit uh, an email attachment that, that I could open, they knew I wouldn't be able to op open it. On the back, he very kindly supplied me with a six-step process to open his email, because of, <laughs> which involved downloading some sort of system. I have no idea what it was. This is, this is one of my favorites here. This is from Ruth. I'm looking at Ruth's work experience, and she tells me um, that she stopped working at one company because they had so little work, they canceled whole shifts day after day for a month. Okay, that's fair. But I didn't really mind since socially their office atmosphere left much to be desired. At best, it was like working for the mafia. At worst, it resembled an emerald mine where the miners were paid in heroin. <laughs> Please do not call my previous manager. This is in the resume, not the cover letter. Oh okay. Yes, uh, I just thought, uh, bad mouther, <laughs> if she's going to describe her last employer as, <laughs> yeah, what's she going to say about me? I don't, I don't think so. Um, here's one, the last one I'll do. Um, and then I'll tell you about some actual people that made it to the table. None of these people made it to the table. <laughs> Encloses my resume to apply for the position you have available. If you're looking to get a problem solver, don't look at me. I think you need to prevent the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wrote back, we need to clarify something. Are you saying that if we're looking for a problem solver, we shouldn't consider you because we should have avoided the problem in the first place? And he didn't bother to respond. Idiot. That was the, this. There's somebody in the back with their hand up. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I didn't have to make up any of those. So Kathy's going to go with the mic, and then I'll go tell you about some people who made it to the table and things didn't go so well. <laughs> when did this get personal, Kathy? But I know, I'm feeling it. <laughs> All right, here you go. Okay, I have to ask, and I'm sure everybody is probably thinking the same thing I am, but what in the world is going through these people's heads? I mean, you know, do they <laughs> what I'm thinking, I mean, it's some just, of you have been oh. through the Employment Immersion Program, right? Yeah. And Kate might be taking you through some fundamental steps that you think, well, wh why is she covering this? Everyone knows this. These examples show you that's just not true. Right. Maybe you know <laughs> what to put or, in a resume. Or on, uh, on probably the word I'm looking for is they just, they don't know, you know. I mean, they, they're, I wouldn't call them dummies. I'd call them uneducated as far as the interview process, as far as jobs, looking for jobs. Because the one thing I've learned here, I've learned a lot here in just, the, what, day and a half I've been here. So, I mean, and I have a lot more to learn. But this has taught me that. I have a lot more to learn, especially when it comes to interviews, filling guide applications, the whole cover letter thing, because I don't want to, I don't want to write something that I'm going to later regret. So. One, of, one of the wonderful things about this summit is that you've got real hiring managers here, people with real world experience, to tell you how you can derail yourself. And these people don't necessarily have that resource. So when you've got employment immersion or you've got Joe Xavier sitting here, I hope you take you take something away from those presentations, even if you think you know it already. Listen to their point of view. Some of us will not agree with each other, but what that does is give you a 360 of the interview process, and you'll take something away from one of us over the four days. Do uh, you? Judy, yeah. um, I remember Mike was saying that there's some people that does not write, uh, le uh, le write. How, many how many percent are bad ones as opposed to good ones? So I want to see my chances. What is there more bad ones than good ones, or is there more good ones than They're bad? They're more good to Midland than bad. Okay. And I picked the extreme examples from the bad. What most do you mean by mid Midland? Uh, people are, are good to, to mediocre, most of them. 
Um, most of them are not like the ones I've read to you, but I get those too, obviously. I think Carol had. Okay, I'm coming oh, yeah. around, Carol. Okay, I, there, I got a weird phone call. I was applying several jobs on Craigslist and I got a call back from some guy and he said, oh, I, you applied for this position on Craigslist. First, no, first let me start from the beginning. He said, is Carol Johnson there? And I said, yes, who is this? And then he starts telling me about how he saw my, my resume or something on Craigslist. And he said, may I speak to Carol Johnson? I didn't tell him it was me because he didn't. First, I asked him, who is this? Mm -hmm. And I asked him a second and a third time, who is this? Who is this? And he kept refusing to tell me. So finally, he said, OK, well, I'm getting off on the wrong foot, so maybe I'll move on to the next person. And I had to tell him, you wouldn't tell me who you were, so I'm suspicious. Of, you know, I mean, I just told him. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. I, I mean, you don't know who you're talking to. And if I'm a hiring manager, I'm not going to play guessing games with you. I'm going to tell you why I'm calling and where I'm calling from. Yeah. That's just yeah, common courtesy. He kept refusing to tell me who he was. Yeah, that's not cool. Um, I talked to a guy on the phone once who was, um, well, actually, no, he knew where I was calling from. And he was giving me the 20 questions. And I, you know, I just got tired of it. And I said, when you can figure out who I am, then you call me back. <laughs> because you know, he'd forgotten who he applied with and what the name of the job was and wh where I worked. And could you read the description to me? No, I can't. No, you figure out who I am, and then you call me. But I would never pl play a game where I, you know, guess who, Carol? That, that's just ridiculous. Um, so uh, some people made it to the table. I got to move on because I've got way more material than I've got time. People who made it uh, to the table, there was one guy. Now, I was a hiring manager in an insurance company. And I, was not, I did not realize asking a question that was specific to an applicant might not be the best course of action. So as it turns out, in this place, I was a clerical supervisor. I had 19 subordinates. My boss, also female. We were all female in my department. In walks this guy. He's doing OK in the interview round. And so I, I finally ask him, look, how would you feel working for all females? I'd be your boss. I'm female. All of your immediate colleagues female. My boss is female. He stopped and thought about it for a minute. He said, well, I guess if you all tell me when it's your time of the month, it'll be fine. Oh. <laughs> Good. Bring him on. Oh. So I laughed with him, and then I moved on to the next <laughs> candidate. <laughs> I probably did. I can't even remember. <laughs> One woman came in, and she was still very hurt from her last job. And so when I started asking her questions about her last work experience, she broke into tears. Now, as a human being, of course, you feel badly for them. But as a hiring manager, you're thinking, you know, this is kind of uncomfortable for me, and I didn't sign on for this. So <laughs> what's going on? That, that's, you want to try to control your emotions. And sometimes, if you're very close to a bad experience and you go out interviewing, it's hard to control your emotions. So try to, try to compartmentalize that before you go out into the world. You don't want people to see these great bursts of any type of emotion. I've had people who were way too exuberant in an interview. Uh, I've had people who were um, emotional for other reasons. I've had people who were drunk, I guess trying to ease their nerves before they came in. <laughs> there was one time I was leaving the office for the day. I'd made a hiring decision, um, and I was trying to leave. And as I left, this woman walks in and says, um, you didn't call me for an interview. And I said, no didn't? Well, I want you to interview me right now. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, I've already actually made a hiring decision. I'm not really inclined to do any more. Now, I am not leaving until you talk to me. Oh Resume with food on it, waving in the air. <laughs> Such a threatening manner that the guys didn't want to leave me in the office alone with this woman. They were afraid for my safety. So we argued for a minute. She just got more and more irate. And I said, OK, all right. So we sit down, and my first question to her is, what makes you think that I would consider hiring you based on the way you came in? And it sort of diffused her after a few minutes, and she decided then, I guess, that maybe it wasn't the best approach. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was kind of scary. And what did she hope to accomplish by just you know, coming out of nowhere like that? I had one guy who's very flirty, very dodgy at the same time. So, oh, are you biracial? Oh, what, are you single? And, uh, what? And he'd fill out his application, but he left data off about things like salary history. And I'd say, well, what did you make at your last job? I don't want to tell you that, or you won't even consider me. 
Well, but it's part of the application. I need the whole application to be filled out before we can do that. Oh, can I take you to lunch? <laughs> so after a while of this, I said, look, if you keep asking me personal questions, I'm going to set aside my stuff, and we'll just talk about me for as long as you want. So that's what we ended up having to do. He wouldn't stop. So we just talked about me, and then I told him he could leave. No, I'm not having lunch with you, and you're not getting hired either, so how about that? <laughs> so you can't afford my lunch, so there. <laughs> there was one guy who was being interviewed round robin. Um, one after another hiring manager would go in, and at this particular uh, nonprofit I worked for, uh, not, dot com I worked for, my uh, boss there was a philosophy major from Stanford. It was excruciating having the simplest conversations with this man. <laughs> I'd go in and say, hey, boss, um, can we have a talk? Well, will this be a discussion or a dialogue? And then we, you know, the next hour and a half, we'd be trying to define what kind of conversation <laughs> that I could have had in one minute. It, it was, it was I, can't, I can't even explain to you how terrible it was. The, the only guy, when he got really wrapped up in himself, the only guy who could decode what he was saying was the MIT guy. So we put MIT up against Stanford. Go talk to him. I can't talk to him. Go, go, go tell him what I said. It was ridiculous. At any rate, we're talking to one guy there, and... This interview candidate had been, he talked, first of all, to philosophy major, so they were together for hours, needless to say. And then one after another of us were interviewing him. By the time he got to me, he knew I was low man on the totem pole. So I'm talking to him, and he's, you know, kind of looking out the window and, and that kind of thing. And his phone rings. He goes, oh, uh, hold on, I have to take this. This is important. Oh. <laughs> um, well, okay, but the fact that I'm part of the hiring team should tell you that maybe you can dismiss me, but do you really want to take that chance? And as it turns out, he reacted that way to everyone except the philosophy guy. And so when we came together to talk as a team, only the philosophy guy liked the guy's interview. Everybody else was negative. He did not get hired. He could have simply answered our questions and kept his phone off. Be careful about phones going off in interviews, by the way. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm gonna jump to, I'm gonna jump down a little bit on my list here. One time I worked in a business park that was near Candlestick Park. You know Candlestick is not in the world's best neighborhood. So there's a business park nearby. I'm rushing back to the office because I have an interview that afternoon. And there's a woman standing in the lot. Uh, and she's on the phone. I can't hear what she's saying, but she seems to be complaining about something. And as I approach her, I hear that she's complaining about the area. I don't know why. I have to rush past her to get into the building anyway. She sees me, uh, has this horrified look on her face, and pulls her purse close to her body like I might try to snatch it on the way in. <laughs> Well, the woman weighed 30 pounds, so I could have taken her in the purse and not even felt the impact. <laughs> so I kind of find it, I found it amusing. <laughs> I found it amusing that she thought, oh, holding it close to her body is going to protect her. Not if I really want that purse lady, but whatever. <laughs> I don't have time to worry about this. I got to get to my interview. So I run upstairs, you know, wipe the crumbs off my mouth. I get ready. Who walks in for my 2 o'clock interview? Oh my God. That woman in the parking lot. And she looked at me, and she knew. And it wasn't that she had been a jerk to me in the parking lot. It was that we had, in this company, I think we had 10 people. Everyone was so diverse. We had everything from Sikhs to pagans working in that office. If she couldn't get along with some stranger in the parking lot who's just trying to get past her, how is she going to work day to day? So I've hired people that I don't like. I have not hired people that I do like. It's not personal. It's how are you going to fit in with the team. Jesse Lorenz would say, I just want to know how big of a pain this person's going to be. That's all I want to know. How much pain are you going to cause me? That's what the hiring manager is trying to get to. Um, some interview fails. Now, it's not always the interviewee's fault. Sometimes it's the interviewer. So not me, of course, but I mean other people, right? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest problem, and I'm almost out of time, so I'll have to make this the end. Um, the biggest problem that you'll run into when you're out there interviewing is an unprepared interviewer. They haven't seen your resume in the three weeks since the uh, HR nerd showed it to them, and they're just, you come in, they've forgotten that you're going to interview, they're scrambling, maybe they'll send in a decoy to buy some time to look over your, interview, your resume one more time. Then they'll come in, and because they're nervous and unprepared, they will talk your head off. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can't tell your stories, maybe you can't give your examples. That's not your fault. That's the fault of the hiring manager. You could go in and be the perfect candidate and not get hired, and I want you to know it's not always your fault. Many times it's our fault because we didn't do our jobs. And so if you walk away from an experience and you think, what could I have done better? Maybe you did the best you could. And that other person needs to own what they've done. I've had hiring managers talk too much. My good friend Lou talked to one guy for two hours before he let the guy say one word. 
I had one who liked to invite personal discussion. He didn't even realize he was doing it, but he wanted to make you feel comfortable because he was a big ex-athlete. So he'd walk in with pictures of his kids and he'd talk about his wife, which would invite you to do the same. But then you're disclosing information that's not necessary for the interview. Things like that. Uh, profanity, I've had hiring managers curse. Personal questions, in fact, I was thinking of Connie. Or Connie, or, yeah. Because Connie's name is Connie Conley Jung, right? And I had an experience that, that's similar to that in that um, I had an Asian woman with a German surname come and interview in one place. And my boss, knowing it was illegal, says, mm, boy, your last name's Reinhardt? Uh, so is your husband uh, European? Is he German? Oh, you, the People's Republic of China, is that what PRC means? Are you Buddhist? <laughs> are you Buddhist? And then and when I interviewed, he asked me, are you married? Do you have children? How old are you? So I knew what kind of man this was. <laughs> but sometimes it's the interview. I could see the woman draw up. She was so offended. Dan? I, sorry? Dan, Dan Kaiser? I, I just have a real quick question yeah. about um, that sort of thing, about um, the interviewers. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times, I know when I was in the legislature lobbying, uh, the uh, a legislator would be like trying to change the subject just to talk about my dog. And um, and I imagine that probably happens in that process too, where the persons are gonna be more, oh, how cute, oh, isn't that dog so cute? And the whole thing is just gonna be all about the pet, or the, the wonderful little guide dog. And so, what can people do to focus, you know, without like rudely interrupting them? You know, I did some mock interviews with some of you and I'm looking at Michael because I thought you handled it really well. I made a point of commenting on the dog in the interview and I remember you, what did you tell me? You were just, you were polite but short. Yes. It was something like, the dog is working. Yes. Oh, can I pet the dog? Yes. Yeah, and you said, no, no, not right now. And then he moved on to the next thing. He didn't linger on it. He didn't stumble on it. He thought about it before. That's the only advice I can really give you is to think about it before. This dog is working, now's not a good time for you to pet, can, yeah, and then try to redirect the conversation if you can, because the dog will be a natural distraction. Or you can say, it's a job. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm not even going there, but I have gone over time. Thank you for your time. Maybe we can revisit Thanks, this over dinner. Julie. <laughs>